I welcome you on behalf of the chairman, all our participants, uh, the trustees of the CSMBS, the director general, and the members of the Museum Society. It really gives me great honor to see two of our distinguished members in our midst today, former chairperson of the Museum Society, Dr. Devangana Desai, and Dr. Saryu Desai, who is for the last four years, an honorary editor who brings out the beautiful Asiatic, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, brings out the beautiful CSMBS academic journal. Thank you both veterans for joining us here today. And Abha, my deepest appreciation that this, despite all the little technical glitches that we've gone through in the last 48 hours, you're here with us today, which with a presentation that I'm sure will delight us all on the subject of Imperial Gardens of Kashmir, courtly and cultural spaces of Mughal India. Abha and I met many, many years ago uh, when she was a young architect, just returned from doing her studies and was in Bombay. And I won't go into the details, but I had given her a very small project Everyone was focusing on fort and oval and the larger spaces. And I said, why not do a shorter, smaller project? And Abha used to come to see me in my office with a three month old baby. And that's how the project on the conservation, restoration and rejuvenation of an area we know as Breach Candy or more formally Bula by Desai Road took place. We had good municipal commissioners helping us, but like everything else in Bombay, it's a very good report, but lacks implementation. I do hope we'll be able to do it. Bandra has done it, other areas in the city have done it. And it's something really worth fighting for now that we're going to have the coastal road go right by. But today on to better things. Our speaker today is a practicing conservation architect and a recipient of the Eisenhower Fellowship USA in 2002, the Charles Wallace Fellowship from the UK in 1998, the Attingham Trust Fellowship in 2007, the Sanskriti Award in 2003, Architect of the Year Award 2019 from Architectural Digest, and Architect of the Year Award CNBC Awards in 2017. Her firm, and I'm sure she's very proud of it, has been included in the top 20 architects list by Architectural Digest and Construction World for the past last five years. She is a consultant to ICCROM, the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, the Go Global Heritage Fund and World Monuments Fund. She's on the governing council of INTAC, the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, and has served on the heritage committees of both metropolises, Delhi and Mumbai. Her firm has won 10 UNESCO Asia Pacific Awards for, the, for heritage conservation. And for over two decades, Abha has the practice, has focused on conservation and museum projects across the country and includes the restoration of the 15th century temples in Leh in the north, Hampi in the south, mosques, palaces, forts, and caravansarais in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, the Punjab, ancient Buddhist sites of Ajanta and Bodh Gaya, regional conservation in Kanjivaram and Shekhavati, and Canolian heritage across Delhi, Pune, Nainital, Kerala, and Mumbai. I think in the last 25 years, Abha, I congratulate you on behalf of all of us. It's quite a resume that you have. And your firm has prepared management plans for UNESCO World Heritage Sites, such as the ancient sites of Ajanta Caves, Bodh Gaya, medieval monuments of Amber Fort, Mughal Gardens in Kashmir, which we're going to hear today, as well as the Corbusier's capital complex, Chandigarh, an icon of modernization. 
An advocate of Mumbai's heritage, Abba has in the past 25 years done pioneering work on urban guidelines for heritage precincts such as Ban Ganga, Kotachi Wadi, DN Road, Dada Bhai Nauroji Road in Mumbai, and has prepared the successful nomination inscribing Mumbai's Art Deco and Victorian Ensemble as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. She has spearheaded the restoration of 19th century landmarks such as the Mumbai University, Convocation Hall, Elphinstone College, the JJ School of Art. <coughs> the Atta Palace as a reuse, which is now the Deutsche Bank, the municipal headquarters in our city, Asiatic Library, High Court, Old Secretariat, Crawford Market. She has advised on museum design for Indian Museum Kolkata and Rashtrapati Bhavan in New Delhi, and our very own CSMBS, Mani Bhavan Mumbai, Bharatpur, and Bangalore State Museums, and is currently working on the Nehru Memorial Library and Museum and Balasaheb Thakare National Memorial and the Lal Bagh Palace Museum in Indore for the World Monuments Fund. Abba has edited a range of books to name a few. Punjab, Land of the Five Rivers. And just before we started our meeting, Abba, that's a lecture we're all looking forward to. It's many years since the book was released. Architecture of the Indian Sultanates and Shekhawati, Land of the Merchant Princes. Besides editing these books, Abba has authored the Victorian and Art Deco Ensemble of Mumbai, to name a few. A City's Legacy, the Indian Navy's Heritage in Mumbai, and Conservation After Legislation, and the issues that Mumbai faces today. A brief synopsis of what Abha is going to talk about today. The idea of Islamic Paradise Garden was transported from Persia through the Arab world, Central Asia, Samarkand, and Kabul to India. Invoking Janak. I'm sure Abha is going to tell you about it, but we all have it in all faiths, in all philosophies, heavenly gardens, paradise garden, garden of Eden. But the feeling of righteousness in the Islamic beliefs within the paradisical landscape of Kashmir and Mughal landscape design, which was influenced by Persia. And this influence was constantly renewed through travel of emissaries, artists, engineers, intermarriage. Whilst Kashmir's ancient capital was a splendorous city with temples and gardens, formal Islamic gardens were introduced to the valley by Persian immigrants in the 14th century. Even in pre-Mughal Kashmir, Shamiri sultans had adopted formal charbagh gardens with biaxial symmetry. Drawing from pre-Mughal indigenous cultivation practices, irrigation techniques and Persian inspired gardens developed by the Shamiris, the Mughals elevated their landscape to an apogee in Kashmir. It's really the highest form, or I would say the development of gardens in India and in our subcontinent. The Imperial Mughal gardens of Kashmir exhibit a strong link with Quranic references, Sufi beliefs, the Zodiac, demonstrating tangible manifestation of cosmological precepts. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not wish to stand between Abha and all of you. So Abha, a very warm welcome, and we're looking forward to your lecture this evening. Welcome to the Museum Society and the CSMBS virtually. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Feroza, for this uh, <coughs> very warm introduction. Uh, it's an absolute delight to uh, be discussing this particular uh, subject with the Museum Society. Uh, for the last one year, and definitely during the lockdown, I've been entirely immersed in, uh, uh, in this subject because uh, uh, my team has been working on preparing a UNESCO nomination dossier for the Mughal Gardens, which uh, include six imperial gardens built uh, in the reigns of Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan. And uh, I will take you through a, a little journey uh, of, of these gardens. So let me begin, uh, if you can all see my screen. This is an image of Nishat Bagh. 
Uh, and what we're looking at primarily as what we call the imperial gardens, because uh, let's remember that at the time of Shah Jahan, you had over 600 pleasure gardens in the Valley of Kashmir itself. So when we're discussing these as part of a UNESCO World Heritage nomination, uh, they're merely six gardens, which are of the imperial uh, Mughals, uh, four in Srinagar, which include Nishat, Shalimar, Chashmashahi, and Pari Mahal, and two in Anantnath district, which is Verinag and Achabal. Uh, if we discuss the history of these gardens and really the beginnings of these gardens, uh, they're fundamentally paradise gardens. And the whole idea of paradise is common to across religions. We see it uh, in Christianity. We, we read about it in the Old Testament book of Genesis as Eden, uh, the biblical allusions to, to a paradise garden and across various faiths from Islam to Buddhism, uh, and across. The etymology of paradise garden really uh, emerges from the word paradesa, from the words meaning around and desa meaning wall, uh, referring to especially a walled garden in the context of Persia, ancient Persia, the Garden of Cyrus in 407 BC. Uh, this idea of a walled garden really became the template on which uh, the Islamic gardens grew. And from ancient times, the Achaemenid Persians basing this, uh, it became almost like uh, a baton that was moved from civilization to civilization, from culture to culture. And the legacy of walled gardens was continued by the Sasanians and then moving on across the continent from Persia to the Iranian plateau to Afghanistan and finally the Indian subcontinent with the Mughals. We also see during the Gandhar art and, and ancient Indian uh, you know, uh, influences derived from this idea. And we see this as an offshoot in Buddhism uh, between the second and fourth century that go on further east to the idea of infinite life and uh, the Chinese M204 and across all the way to Japan. So the whole concept of, uh, of paradise being a garden is almost something which is common to perhaps all faiths. Uh, and here we have to the left um, an image from depicting Solomon being advised by animal from the Chester Beauty Museum uh, collection from the Anwar Suheli. And on the right, an image from Hamza Nama, uh, which again has a very strong link to uh, particularly to the garden of Verinag in Kashmir, uh, because you this image of the depiction of an octagonal water body around which a garden emerges uh, is particularly in literature uh, seen in, in the, the work of uh, Amir Khosro uh, in the 13th century, where almost as, uh, as a response to Nizami's work of uh, the Haft Paikar, uh, Amir Khosro uh, puts across the idea of the Hasht Spihisht or the, or the Eighth Paradise. Uh, and the Eighth Paradise, especially as a Sufi cosmological precept, uh, is something that is very strong in, in the entire derivation of the formal plan of the Verinag Garden. So when we come to Islam in particular, uh, Quranic verses allude to uh, a walled enclosure, a walled garden uh, with, with running water. And, uh, and greenery. And the idea of the paradise garden, therefore, is inextricably linked to Islamic eschatology. We have, we have various references to a garden paradise, a garden beneath which rivers flow. Uh, and the, the whole idea in a dry, arid land of a, a walled enclosure, almost like an oasis with abundant water, uh, with shade giving trees, fruits, blossoms, uh, as well as fountains of running water became, uh, became the idea, the idea uh, that sort of remained with the concept of paradise garden. Now in Arabic with Jannah, uh, then being taken to Persian as Jannat, the idea again crosses countries and regions, uh, which goes across uh, to Spain in, in Alhambra in one direction and 
through, uh, through Samarkand and Kabul uh, comes to India with, with Babur. Uh, but when we, see the, when we see the depiction right through art uh, across, uh, across centuries, with Islam, we begin to see a very strong depiction of the four-quartered formal garden with a central water body, with pavilions, and a certain uh, depiction of tree species that remain with, uh, with the Islamic garden. The gardens of Kashmir, uh, in contrast to most other Islamic gardens in, uh, in the subcontinent especially, uh, were not attached to tombs, were not attached to palaces, and were by themselves as uh, standalone, as pleasure gardens. And therefore, the Mughal gardens of Kashmir represent a very long tradition and the zenith of the evolution of the Islamic garden, from the early Persian examples to the gardens of the Central Asian Ilkukhs, the descendants of the Mongols, Genghis Khan, uh, along with those derived from Timur's garden in Samarkand, Babur's bags in Kabul, and finally from Babur to Shah Jahan, they depict and they stand for the gardens of the greatest Mughal emperors of India. The idea of divine kingship was also linked to these gardens. Uh, the idea was propagated by Akbar, and it's interesting because the, the Mughal gardens in Kashmir really begin uh, with the story of Akbar uh, conquering Kashmir, and uh, especially with the tradition of gardens begun by him in Kashmir, followed through by the two emperors who we largely ascribe most of the imperial gardens to, uh, Jahangir and Shah Jahan. And whereas in other parts of the Mughal realm, uh, this was generally employed for tombs of emperors and their queens, the gardens of Kashmir alluded to the promise of Islamic paradise in life, not just in death. The paradise gardens of Mughal Kashmir therefore exemplify the concept of paradise attained in life and allude to the Mughal idea of Jannat and therefore divine kingship. So even in the studies of flora, uh, there, is a, the, 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 there is a proclamation of the emperor's interest in, uh, in the mysteries of creation and therefore through their memoirs, both Babur and uh, Jahangir especially, uh, speak about, you know, in great depth, they discuss and describe flowers and, and plant species. And it's almost like it's part of that, uh, you know, the, the, the traditions of extra Quranic revelations of hidden treasures who wanted to be known. So what heightened the experience of the Paradise Gardens of Kashmir was the allegorical quality of Kashmir's paradisical landscape. The Mughals had very, for very long held Kashmir as the promised land. They saw it as an evolution of paradise itself. Repeatedly, therefore, in Mughal literature, in Mughal poetry, travel accounts, and chronicles, Kashmir was described as Kashmir Jannat Nazir, or Kashmir that is paradise-like. Uh, it was referred by, to by the, uh, the Mughal emperors as Subai Dilpazir, or the province close to the heart. Therefore, the establishment of Kashmir as Jannat Nazir became a very strong literary as well as a political construct, uh, which was consciously built by the Mughals over the 16th and 17th centuries. And this, in a sense, merged uh, with the Mughal aspirations for, and for establishing and later for validating Mughal control over the valley and across the subcontinent. Uh, it's also interesting to know that the narrative of Kashmir as paradise is really strengthened by, by Mughal chroniclers. So Abul Fazl dedicated a complete section of, to Kashmir's history uh, and the natural beauty uh, in the Akbar Nama. And uh, he accompanies Akbar on his first visit to the valley. Uh, Muhammad Faidi, the, the poet laureate, composed a qasida towards uh, you know, describing Kashmir uh, in a way, putting into words the desire of, of the Mughals uh, to, to have Kashmir as part of their territory. And that we see because right from the time of Babur uh, and then Humayu, the Mughals were always trying to get their hands on Kashmir and wrest control of the valley because to them, this was really uh, in this harsh, hot, uh, 
dry land of Hindustan or, and, and Babur often complains of the heat and dust of Hindustan. To the Mughals, Kashmir spelt heaven and really paradise uh, on earth. And then if we talk about Mughal, uh, the Timurid traditions, so what is interesting when we look at uh, the traditions of garden building uh, is that the Mughals really were, were combining uh, traditions of both Islamic and Persian gardens that were already there in, in Kashmir before the Mughals came to Kashmir, but also Timurid traditions. And uh, Timur, as we know, in uh, wrested control of Persia. And when he sacked Persia, uh, that too had an influence on Kashmir because we see in the 14th century a, a mass exodus of Persians and especially Shias to the kingdom of Kashmir. This is before Kashmir came into uh, Mughal uh, hands. And that led to Kashmir and the Shamiri dynasty of Kashmir that predates the Mughals already having knowledge of Persian gardens from the Persian emigres who were fleeing Persia uh, because of Timur's conquests. Uh, as a parallel uh, development, Timur, uh, with the conquest of Persia, was so influenced by the, the gardens, the Persian gardens that he saw there, that he took upon himself to create uh, or to, to transform Samarkand into this garden uh, paradise. And the Timurids uh, really built with all their wealth from successful campaigns across Asia and Persia uh, to create, they began to create these amazing charbags in Samarkand. Uh, the master craftsmen too were brought in by Timur from India to Samarkand. And with the sack of Delhi in 1398, uh, there was obviously no, uh, no budgets or restrictions as far as that goes. And therefore you see the creation of, gra of grand gardens in Samarkand at the time of Timur. And that really describes and in a sense um, sets the foundation for uh, the legacy of garden building that the Mughals were later to continue with. So the history of Mughals, uh, we all know, uh, from Babur to Shah Jahan, the five Mughal emperors, uh, were great rulers, were, were fierce warriors, but at the same time, the common passion they shared was that of garden building. Uh, and amongst them all, they've, they've created some of the most beautiful gardens across across Kashmir, Lahore, Punjab, Delhi, Agra, Ajmer, uh, Ujjain, Dholpur, one of the earliest gardens, uh, the Bagani Lofer by Babur. And this tradition of garden building uh, can be traced to Timur's Charbags in Samarkand, and then Babur's gardens in Kabul, Panipat, Dholpur, and Agra. But what's also interesting is that it is not just the, uh, the men, but the women among the Mughals are equally involved in the, in the uh, creation of gardens. And right from the time of Babur's aunts and Babur's uh, daughters to, to Akbar's uh, uh, period and Humayu's wife, and then obviously to Noor Jahan, we see gardens being laid out by Mughal women. And that, uh, in a sense, uh, is, is one of the most interesting traditions uh, that the Mughals uh, uh, demonstrate with even some of the Kashmir gardens being built by, by women patrons. So when we see, uh, see the, the genealogy of Mughals, uh, the three Mughals who are involved with the act of garden building in Kashmir are really uh, the three emperors, Akbar, uh, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan. Uh, and whereas Akbar builds uh, the first garden, uh, which is within Hari Parbat, the fort that he built in Kashmir, and then at the foothills of Hari Parbat, uh, he built the Naseem Bagh or uh, the Garden of the Winds, uh, which then uh, is which stands even today, although in a in a rather transformed state. Uh, he also then went on to build a garden uh, within the fort, uh, which was later. Uh, restored by his son Jahangir and renamed Bar Bagh-e-Noor Afza uh, in Kashmir. Uh, 
but really the, the greatest, uh, the epoch of true garden building uh, begins with Jahangir, uh, where he uh, where he be begins creation of gardens at a very large scale. And uh, from the period, we have the Verinag Bagh in Kashmir, Achabal, Shalimar, and then during his reign, his daughter Jah uh, 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 Jahangir's uh, son, uh, Shah Jahan, goes on to build uh, the Fez Baksh and Farah Baksh gardens of Shalimar. And finally, we have Shah Jahan, who as Prince Hurram be begins with the construction of the Shalimar gardens. And then during his reign, we have the Chashme Shahi built by his governor and his son, uh, Darashiko, creating the gardens of Parimehel. His daughter, uh, Jaha Ara, creates, adds to the, the garden of Achabal that was earlier designed and laid out by Noor Jaha. And uh, in the Shah Jaha period, we also have Noor Jaha's brother, uh, Asif Jaha, build, building the Shat Bagh in Kashmir. So the Mughals were really creating a legacy of garden making and uh, with a formidable ancestry uh, that uh, Babur traced to both Chinggis Khan on the maternal side and Timur on the paternal side. Uh, he, his claim of being emperor of Hindustan was really based on his grand legacy and he continues this uh, legacy through his garden building and uh, if uh, and within, uh, in his memoir, he writes that my desire for Hindustan has been constant. Uh, he mounted a total of five expeditions to India, finally resting control in 1526. But what is also interesting is that in his memoirs, during his, his you know, fierce battle that led to the Battle of Panipat, in his campaign and right in the middle of his campaign, while he is camping near the river Ghagar in Punjab, uh, he actually finds time to build a garden. And I think that speaks for, uh, you know, another side to the Mughals, because we always know them as these fierce warriors. But they, they were poets, they were garden makers. And uh, uh, we see a, a far more liberal side where uh, when Babur finally rests control of Agra, and uh, he builds, uh, you know, he consolidates his, his control on Agra. He calls for the women of his household. And when they come down from Kabul and make the long journey towards Agra, uh, Princess Gulbadan records that he made gifts of land to all the women in his family. And in fact, instructs the architect to make sure that he listens to what the ladies have to say and spare no expense. So we have along the riverbank of the Yamuna in Agra, uh, a, an, an enclave of gardens that emerges with, with Barber's aunts and the women of the household building their own gardens. And uh, we see later with, uh, with Jahangir and uh, Jahangir's memoir is also mentioning when Jahangir goes back to uh, Kabul, he mentions gardens of his aunts and gardens of his grandmother. And therefore, this tradition of gardens being built uh, during times of war and during times of leisure is something that is, is uh, very interesting and uh, peculiar to, uh, to the Mughals. So, in Kabul, Babur laid out the gardens of Baghe Khaja Si Yara and Baghe Wafa, or the Garden of Fidelity. He mentions in his memoirs, I laid out the four gardens known as Baghe Wafa. And here he, with four gardens, he is referring to them being a char bagh or a quadripartite garden and not really four garden projects. In the middle of it, a one mill stream flows constantly past the hill on which are four garden plots. In the southwest, round which are orange trees and a few pomegranates, the whole encircled by a trefoil meadow. In Panipat, the site of his over Hindustan, 
He builds in Thanksgiving the first royal mosque of the Mughal dynasty. It still stands today, and it is. And interestingly enough, instead of being called the Babri Masjid,、uh, the name of the masjid and locally known by、uh, is Kabuli Masjid, because to the to the locals of Hindustan, this man was the king of Kabul, and he comes to Panipat, wins the battle, and then builds a mosque, which is.、Uh, And therefore, the name of the mosque and the the char bag garden that he builds with it came to be known as the Kabuli Bag Masjid or the the mosque、uh, with the garden by the man from Kabul. And, and this is in the 16th century, in 1526. And we've had、uh, you know 400 years of Islamic rule by then. Uh, but the Indian subcontinent had witnessed Islamic architecture for centuries prior to Mughal rule. It is, however, Babur who introduced the formal walled charbagh, and that then became the prototype of the Mughal gardens from for time to come. And in his brief reign as emperor of Hindustan, Babur lived in his charbagh in tented encampment. And that is really true to Babur Nama,、uh, and I quote: "Since my eleventh year, I had not kept the Ramzan feast for two successive years in the same place. Last year, I had kept it in Agra. This year, saying 'Don't break the rule,' I went on the last day of the month to keep it in Sikri. Tents were set up on a stone platform made on the northeast side of the Garden of Victory, which is now being laid out at Sikri, and in them the feast was held." The- Garden of Babur in Sikri does not survive.、Uh, the garden in Dholpur, the Bagani Lofer, is just a small stone tank,、uh, while the rest of the garden is,、uh, you know, under under literally agricultural fields, and a village settlement、uh, stands on it.、Uh, the gardens of Babur in Agra,、uh, the Bagi Zarafshan,、uh, or the Garden of the Gold Scattering, was largely redeveloped and.、Uh, And remodeled by Nur Jahan, and even the name was changed to Bagh in Nur Afsa,、uh, and therefore we don't really have much left of the gardens of Babur.、Uh, but what he did leave was this very strong Mughal tradition of a formal geometry of、uh, the four-quartered char bagh, of running water,、uh, and terraces. And in in his in the Babur Nama. Babur also mentions that he went to Samarkand, and he wasn't very fond of the fact that there was no running water in the gardens. And、uh, he makes sure when he builds that he builds with terraces and he builds with with running water. And that is really what reaches a pinnacle and its zenith of garden making when we see the gardens of、um, of Kashmir. The next Mughal. Humayun, as James Westcott describes、uh, him,、uh, his garden legacy is really one of ephemeral innovation. I'm glad you're. He's he's part of the the audience today,、uh, and that has inspired Akbar to create gardens along the marshy lands of the Dal in Kashmir. But what is also interesting is when、uh, we do ascribe. Uh, the garden building of Kashmir in the swampy, marshy lands around the Dal.、Uh, that is really something that they've learned directly from the Shamiri Sultan Zain Labdin,、uh, and it's actually documented also in、uh, in the various、uh, you know、um, records of the Mughals. But but because、uh, Humayun's reign was rather short, and within a decade of his rule, he had to flee to Persia.、Uh, what we don't have are、uh, surviving gardens. But we do have Gulbadan Begum, his his aunt, recording.、Uh, his Majesty visited all the gardens and the flower gardens and the splendid buildings and the grand structures of olden days. So, in a way,、uh, Humayun's exile to Persia helps reinforce the link to Persian gardens. And、uh, I would like to believe that that stay in Persia, where he was reintroduced to the Persian gardens. Uh, and when、uh, his wife Bega Begum finally brings Persian architects and、uh, landscapers to Delhi to eventually build his tomb,、uh, that was really another interchange when the Mughals and the Persians under Shah Tamas renewed their influence 
on, of the Persian garden on the Mughal landscape. Uh, by the time we get to Akbar, uh, it's interesting because Akbar himself was as a little boy hurriedly enthroned on a platform built in a garden at Kalanor. And uh, Jahangir writes that on Wednesday, the 2nd of Bahaman, which is January the 12th, imperial camp was made in the garden at Kalanor. And it was here that His Majesty Arsh Ashiani acceded to the throne. So the Mughals continue this nomadic tradition of camping in these gardens and therefore the pleasure gardens, which sometimes then become funerary gardens when a tomb is built inside them, uh, they, they really act as encampments, as, as uh, ephemeral palaces for the Mughals and all they have to do is pitch camp and that becomes a palace. Uh, and that really becomes uh, the reason for the Mughals building these amazing gardens in Kashmir uh, because of the, of the weather where they did not feel the need to really build uh, heavy structures. So in his reign, um, the, we see the construction of the grandest project of the Mughals until then, which is Humayun's tomb. And this also uh, reinforces the tradition of women patrons and women builders of gardens among the Mughals. So we have Hamida Begum or Bega Begum, uh, who's also called Haji Begum because she led a team of women uh, to, uh, for the pilgrimage of Hajj, uh, who is here the builder and the patron of the garden. And this garden is attributed to a family of garden designers from Bukhara, who based the designs on the Irshad al Zara, which is the Timurid horticultural treaties and includes a chapter on Charbagh layouts. Uh, and what we have as a very formal Charbagh garden uh, within the, the garden setting of Humayun's tomb uh, becomes the you know, the standards then later emperors follow for their tombs. Uh, Babur is really known for his, uh, his gardens. The Pusikri are not the remnants of the softscape of the gardens, but the, the planning that is around Charbags. And uh, that, in a sense, uh, for as much uh, uh, of, of Humayu's legacy that stays ephemeral, uh, I think Akbar tried to overcompensate with stone and and bastions and walls and sandstones. Uh, so here we have uh, what not just the emperors building themselves, but their wives, their begums, their uh, mothers uh, commanding gardens be made. And uh, right from that of, of uh, uh, Humayu's tomb to the construction of the garden uh, the garden tomb of Itmad Dola then sets the tone for Shah Jahan's uh, Taj Mahal to follow. Uh, the women of the Mughal household are active uh, supporters of garden making. Uh, when we see Akbar's role, what is really critical is it is in the time of Akbar that we see the Mughals actually coming to Kashmir. And Akbar thus lays the foundation of the Mughal garden building in Kashmir. Uh, at a much older age in 1589 Akbar visits Kashmir for the first time and before he arrives in Kashmir he sends 5,000 workmen, miners and stone cutters in advance to enable that very long and treacherous journey of the entire Mughal encampment and the court moving uh, from Agra to Kashmir. And uh, the N.A. Akbari records at the present time under the sway of his imperial majesty it is the secure and happy abode of many nationalities, including natives of Persia and Turkestan, and as well as of Kashmir. Uh, so Akbar makes three visits in all to Kashmir. He made two more visits in 1592 and 97, and uh, established, therefore, the tradition of the imperial Mughal courts moving uh, from Agra or later Lahore to Kashmir. And thus the gardens of Kashmir really became both the courtly spaces as well as the cultural spaces of empire. Uh, he also is accompanied on his trips to Kashmir by the young uh, prince who later became Jahangir. And Jahangir memoirs record uh, his spending time in the saffron fields with his father. 
and his first acts as emperor therefore are those of restoring akbar's garden in in uh, kashmir uh, this painting uh, from the vna shows akbar and you can see him as an older man uh, sitting in a charbagh garden and you can see the octagonal water channels uh, water pools and gushing water and interestingly in the corner you will uh just behind akbar right in the center of the frame uh you can see sprigs of narcissi uh alluding to this being in kashmir and even though humayu mentions that the ideal of a mughal garden are narcissi and roses in a row uh and he does initially try and and cultivate narcissi in his gardens in agra we all know that in the hot uh landscape of of the gangetic plains uh, we could not have had or expected the narcissi to have survived for long so it is really in the valley of kashmir uh, that the moguls finally find a landscape that is as close as possible climatically to kabul and to fargana and can actually allow the plantation of plant species uh, what Uh, the the species that are true to the timurid uh, ilkhanid uh, cultivation patterns so the plant species of tulips and peonies and uh, narcissus uh, which are which are possible to grow in kashmir uh, remain special and the only gardens of their kind in in the entire realm of the moguls So Akbar's earliest pleasure gardens in Kashmir were the ones he built inside the Hari Parbat Fort, and then the Lakeside Garden of Nasim Bagh. Uh, and this really consolidates the Mughal foothold in Kashmir. Uh, before the Mughals arrived in Kashmir, we have uh, garden making, uh, which is under uh, in, under uh, the Shamiris. And as I said earlier, uh, by the 14th century, with the exodus. Uh, of and the migration of of uh, persians fleeing timur towards kashmir we see the beginnings of persian gardens in the shamiri period within kashmir and uh, if you can see this uh, painting at the back uh, we see lotuses blooming uh, in in a uh, in a lake and we see the creation of gardens around them and what zainal abdin did is which was considered to be phenomenal for the time uh, is to create floating gardens in the wular uh, lake in kashmir and this is recorded in both ene akbari and then the tuske jahangiri where jahangir and akbar actually went to see and witness for themselves this phenomena of floating gardens in inside the middle of the lake and uh, jahangir writes how uh, they finally understood that they would take boats and fill them with stones and sink those boats to create these gardens and from the shamiris the moguls learned uh, irrigation systems because until they they actually came to kashmir uh, the moguls continued to use water and source water for their gardens from persian wells and from wells so the entire massive uh, you know water system within humayun's tomb is really even though humayun's tomb is sited on the banks of the yamuna the source of water is through a well and through a persian uh, a wheel uh, taking water from the well so you can imagine how limited the quantity of water and uh, the supply of water is and there right until uh, the 17th century uh, with the taj mahal uh, and then later in in late mughal period with the safdarjung stone the quantity of water was rather meager for the scale of these gardens this was the exact opposite in kashmir because during the shamiri period uh, zainal abdin had actually built nehers or canals to source water from river streams directly into the gardens and the gardens of kashmir therefore were either directly sited on natural springs as is the case of chashmishahi and verinag or along gushing water streams uh as in the case of achhabal and for those which were not they were either visually connected to large water bodies like uh, shalimar nishat and pari mahal overlooking the dal lake but both for shalimar and nishat they took on this wisdom of 
of Neher building and of building these canals to divert water to feed their gardens of Shalimar and Nishat. So building on the Shamiri uh, wisdom, the, the Mughals were able to elevate their design and their hydrology for gardens to create these phenomenal gardens with abundant water supply. Uh, we also see in Kashmir, uh, right uh, you know, through the 11th century, uh, the discussion of Kashmir with its gardens and with its, its gardens of magnificent beauty for its coolness in summer, we do uh, hear in Panini's grammar and, and uh, uh, you know, the mention of saffron and uh, the mention of cultivation of apricots and plums and grapes in Kashmir. So Kashmir already had a very robust tradition of, of cultivation and of gardening, which helped uh, raise the level of garden design for the Mughal gardens that were to come. Uh, but truly the greatest uh, gift to Kashmir's gardens and the greatest builder of Kashmir's gardens was Jahangir. And uh, Jahangir, as I mentioned, uh, fell in love with Kashmir as a young prince when he accompanied Akbar. Uh, and he mentions in 1619, since I had decided upon departing for the garden of perennial spring. So, uh, so Jahangir very poetically describes Kashmir as the garden of perennial spring. Uh, and then he, he mentions how he sends again in advance laborers such as stone cutters, carpenters, shovelers uh, ahead. And between Noor Jahan and Jahangir, they together collaborate and partner uh, in the creation of these imperial gardens. So uh, while Akbar visited Kashmir only thrice, uh, Jahangir makes multiple trips to Kashmir. And with that, you see the shift of the center of capital moving from Agra to Lahore, and also the creation of these sarais and the Karva sarais along the Mughal route. Uh, which aided uh, this movement of supply and people uh, that were making the trek uphill to Kashmir each year. And uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have the famous uh, Persian uh, couplet by, by Jahangir, uh, when at the time of death, Jahangir was asked what he desired. Uh, with the desire of heart, he replied, Kashmir and nothing else. And he managed to do that because he died in Chinggis uh, en route uh, Lahore and uh, he died in uh, just outside the valley of Kashmir and his entrails were buried there and his body was hastily taken away to Lahore to be buried by uh, Nur Jahan and then when she buries him in, in uh, uh, the garden that was then a pleasure garden she places on his cenotaph uh, depictions of cyclamens as an ode to Kashmir and his love for Kashmir. So of all the Mughals, it is really and truly Jahangir who was completely enchanted by uh, the guard, by Kashmir and uh, became the greatest champion of garden making. So we see the royal entourage would travel for months together, making various stops. Uh, and it would take almost five months for the entire Mughal court to move up to Kashmir. And uh, in, in his earlier, uh, you know, writings in his memoirs, Jahangir mentions that I've never seen the beauty of spring in Kashmir, but uh, autumn is beautiful. And then he describes autumn. He dis and later he mentions, uh, he describes spring when he does arrive in spring uh, in a particular year. And uh, he spends uh, you know, a great amount of time describing individual flowers, like uh, there's a passage which goes into great depths to describe the crown imperial, and he mentions how unique the flower is, or he mentions the tulips blooming on the rooftop of the Jame Masjid uh, in Kashmir. And uh, so we have, during Jahangir's period, the construction of gardens also outside Kashmir. So in Sikandra, which was his father's tomb, he does record that he was unhappy with the way the architects had designed it. And then he, dis, you know, he uh, suggested a lot of remodeling. He redesigned the, the garden of Sikandra and created another, a new gateway. Uh, he also, uh, you know, visits Empress Noor Jahan every time she throws a garden party and she invites him to see uh, the Noor Mahal Sarai or she invites him 
uh, to a garden in Agra. Uh, so all that is is uh, definitely recorded. But truly, what what he learns in Kashmir is this creation of gardens uh, around the Dal Lake. And this miniature, paint, this painting, is interesting because it actually shows. Uh, the the little Mughal party of uh, the emperor going in these boats to the center of the of the lake uh, to to see for himself the floating garden built by Zain al Abdin and you can see in the the painting uh, the you know the the tall mountains that are undoubtedly the Himalayas uh, the uh, the uh, the setting of Kashmir is so so clear in this painting. So, uh, as I mentioned, I will quote from uh, the from Jahangir's memoirs. Autumn and spring in Kashmir are things worthy to be seen. I witnessed the autumn season and appeared to me to be better than what I'd heard of. I've never seen spring in that province, but hope to do someday. And then later in the spring in 1625, he mentions how at an auspicious hour on Tuesday the 18th, the imperial retinue descended in the pleasant palace in the happy vale of Kashmir. Although it was at the end of the blossom season in the Noor Manzil garden uh, on the palace grounds, the blue jasmine filled the nostrils with perfume and outside the city, many varieties of beautiful blooms could be seen. Uh, he goes on to describe, as I mentioned, the crown imperial, calling it one strange flower with an odd shape. It had five or six orange colored flowers blooming with their heads down and several leaves were poking out from inside the flowers. Uh, the flowers of Kashmir are beyond counting or enumeration. He calls them Behisab. Which ones shall I write about? How many can one write about? Only those that are really special can be recorded. And this is important because when he does record them, Jahangir commissions the court painter, Ustad Mansur, to record 100 wildflowers of Kashmir. And that is truly significant because here an emperor who is uh, interested in nature and who, who you know, uh, loves recording strange animals and strange, you know, we've seen that uh, his accounts of the zebra, uh, for instance, how he actually commissions Mansoor to draw up a folio of a hundred wildflowers of Kashmir and how that then becomes the uh, in a sense, the standard by which uh, Mughal art, Mughal architecture, and Mughal decoration move from that from the geometry or the the arabesques and the uh, the cal calligraphy as as the decoration to floral uh, representation in art. So uh, we see in the first instance in among the gardens of Kashmir, uh, we see. Uh, Jahangir first paying homage to his father and uh, in 1620 he records a celebration in honor of opening of a picture gallery in the the fort that Akbar had built and he mentions uh, you know uh, uh, how he actually sent Haider Malik to Kashmir to reroute the stream from Lar Valley to Noor Afzal Gardens to provide water for the garden. So he, uh, these are uh, the, the canals that Jahangir begins building, uh, like the Shamiris, to irrigate the gardens of Kashmir. And, uh, and later, he gives an account of the Noor Afza garden. He says, there is one more garden known as Dolat Khana Ali, which is famous by the name of Noor Afza. One can hardly find any example of its beauteous scenery, cleanliness, and flourishing flower plants anywhere else on earth. And here, uh, Jahangir, therefore, after Babur, becomes really the, the true gardener of Mughal India. Uh, he is the most passionate of the naturalists among the Mughals. And when he commissioned uh, Ustad Mansur, uh, who he calls Nad Nadirul Asr, or the wonder of the epoch, he, when he commissions him to create this illustrated folio of 100 Kashmiri flowers, he writes, the flowers that are seen in the territories of Kashmir are beyond all calculation. Those that Nadirul Asri Ustad Mansur has painted are more than a hundred. And what happens, therefore, is this, uh, this representation of Kashmiri flowers that captures the imagination of Mughal artists. And after Mansur, 
we have Manohar and we have so many other uh, Mughal painters of the period who begin creating these very naturalistic uh, representations of, of Kashmiri flowers in their paintings and especially around painted borders. So during the time of Jahangir and Shah Jahan in particular, we see the entire style of Mughal painting moving from this very stylized Persian, uh, almost very flat uh, rep uh, representation of human and, and plant figures uh, that we see as an influence of uh, the, the painters who, who, were, who, who came with Humayun uh, from the Persian court into uh, into the Mughal Karkhanas. But then we see this shift towards a very naturalistic and an abundant abundance of, of Kashmiri floral uh, depiction in the borders of these uh, paintings. And what is interesting is that many of the older paintings are reframed with these borders of Kashmiri flowers. And uh, this then becomes the high style of Mughal art uh, in the period. And we can see it, uh, you know, one after the other. Uh, to the right, the bottom right, is uh, uh, a surviving Mansoor depiction of, uh, of a tulip. And this is a tulipa Kashmiriana, which you see uh, in Mansoor's representation. Un uh, unfortunately, we don't have all the rest of the hundred surviving, but of the few that do survive, you can see that these are almost botanical specimens of Kashmir's flora. And uh, therefore, we see this taking over and influencing Mughal art to come. So under Jahangir, we see the creation of the first few gardens. So we have the gardens of Shalimar, of Verenag and Achbal created in the Jahangir period. Uh, Jahangir is really, uh, he starts almost an enclave of garden building uh, in the area around Dal. So he gifts plots of, uh, of land uh, to uh, the prince who then becomes Shah Jahan. And Shah Jahan as prince creates the garden of Shalimar, which is later added to when he becomes emperor. So you have Shalimar built in two phases as Baghe Farah Baksh and Baghe Fez Baksh. And that together becomes really the first uh, grand imperial garden that ser serves as both court and zanana and uh, for Mughal Darbar, uh, and pretty much serves the same function as Lahore Fort or uh, uh, Fatehpur Sikri or Agra Fort uh, would have done. Uh, and whereas you see the selection of site is obviously for this amazing beauty, but you also see in the site selection uh, a consciousness of the sacred geography of Kashmir. So the site of Shalimar is the site of an ancient garden of King Pravarsen II uh, in, in, of ancient Kashmir, uh, which is even today, uh, this area is called Ishbar, uh, after the, the, uh, you know, the little ashram at Ishbar that was uh, established in the Hindu period. It is set against the, the backdrop of the Mahadev mountains. Uh, we have the selection of Verinag uh, on the source of the river Jhelum, which is considered uh, for centuries as a holy site uh, by the Kashmiri Pandits and the local Hindus. So Verinag, which, uh, which, which is a sacred site of the Hindus and where we still see uh, you know, puja being, being conducted uh, becomes the site of the garden of Verinag and the same with Achabal with, with, uh, within this sort of uh, sacred geography of Kashmir. Uh, whereas Pari Mahal, which was the site of an ancient Buddhist Vihar, then becomes in the time of, uh, of Darashiko, uh, a pleasure garden. Uh, we also have mention uh, in the Akbar Nama of uh, Chashme Shahi, uh, which, is, which then later becomes a garden in, in Shah Jahan's period, uh, as a holy um, spring that has medicinal property, uh, which has healing property. So very, uh, the Mughals are acutely aware of both the beauty as well as the significance and uh, the sacred geography of, uh, of these uh, gardens within Kashmir. This is a Mughal painting uh, by Abul Hassan, uh, dated 60, between 1650 and 1620. And uh, I believe this is of, uh, 
of Emperor Jahangir in the Shalimar garden. Because if you see the, the really steep incline, uh, this sort of a steep incline is possible only in the Kashmir gardens, given the contours of the land. Uh, you also notice that uh, the plane trees, uh, the poplars and the chinars are depicted uh, very realistically in this image. And we also see flowers such as the narcissus and iris uh, in, this, in this image. And here you can see uh, the emperor is feasting and you can see dervishes. And that also draws from the existing Sufi um, traditions of Kashmir, which are already well entrenched uh, in Kashmir when, uh, when Jahangir and Akbar come to visit Kashmir. At the same time, we have a lot of noblemen and governors of Kashmir who are e of, the, of Mughals who are equally uh, enthusiastic about building gardens. And by the time of uh, Shah Jahan, we have over 600 garden estates across the valley of Kashmir. So Kashmir virtually becomes this, this, uh, you know, uh, this valley of pleasure gardens. So even the Kushwaha kings of Amir, who are uh, related to Jahangir by, you know, both his mother and his uh, wife were from the royal uh, family of the Kushwahas of Amir. The, the, the Kushwahas are given a Jagir in the valley built by them. And that is how you see this connection in the depiction of irises and narcissi in the, the frescoes of Amir. So this link of, of Kashmir is really something that then uh, almost penetrates every aspect of Mughal and even Rajput gardens and architecture uh, from the time of Jahangir. Uh, Shah Jahan as the next ruler already has, has made his first garden and his first great pro gardening project is in Kashmir with the Shalimar gardens. And that then becomes the high ideal of Mughal gardens. So uh, almost as an aspirational quality or almost as a tribute to the beauty of Shalimar Bagh in Kashmir, his gardens which are built later in Lahore are named Shalimar Bagh. And uh, one of his begums in Delhi later builds another garden, which he names Shalimar Bagh. And there are all these uh, written in literature. There are various allusions to, uh, to the gardens of uh, Behisht and the gardens of Shalimar. Uh, therefore, Shalimar Bagh in Kashmir becomes the high ideal uh, and really the benchmark uh, to all later Mughal gardens. Uh, and after that, we see just one visit by uh, by Aurangzeb to Kashmir, which during that visit we have Bernier recording and documenting, and he's fascinated by the the old jets and the amazing fountains of Kashmir uh, gardens, which he has not seen anywhere else, and which I would like to, uh, you know, I would guess would have influenced gardens, uh, or at least uh, been discussed in the salons of Europe as well. Uh, but because of his very strong uh, you know, religious beliefs, Aurangzeb does not add to garden making as emperor. And therefore, this uh, tradition of royal patronage to garden making in Kashmir almost ceases. And then you have the brief Afghan rule where there is, there is no willful destruction of gardens, but there is definitely not great care taken towards looking after these Mughal gardens. But unlike most other gardens, which tend to not have survived in their entirety, I mean, even the gardens of, of Babur in Afghanistan have gone through massive transformation. The Mughal gardens of Kashmir, uh, which are uh, 400 years old, survived this destruction and survived uh, ransacking. So you have the gardens of the Shalimar gardens of Lahore, uh, you had during the Sikh rule, uh, uh, Ranjit Singh's uh, men carted away many marble benches and thrones to, uh, to Amritsar for their garden. Uh, fortunately, the gardens of Kashmir survived that loot and plunder. And when with the Treaty of Amritsar in 1846, after the first Anglo-Sikh war, Kashmir came to the Dogras, perhaps because the Kashmir gardens did, were not associated with tombs or mosques or therefore any religious associations. The Dogras embraced them and looked after them. And then in the 19th century, there are various 
uh, accounts by Britishers of garden parties of the Maharaja, the Dogra Maharajas, held in the gardens of Nishat and Charmar, and evenings where the gardens were lit, and Villiers Stuart uh, describes them in great detail. Uh, so they fortunately survived this mass destruction. Uh, so here we are going back to Shah Jahan. Uh, Shah Jahan as, is the, the greatest of all Mughal builders, uh, undoubtedly. But we also see that whereas the gardens of the Taj Mahal come after his gardens of, of uh, Shalimar and Nishat, uh, here the gardens of Taj Mahal are still funerary gardens. And uh, he's alluding to paradise after death, while uh, the gardens of Kashmir and Shalimar remain paradise in life. Uh, so we have... Uh, after that, as I mentioned, with Mansoor uh, having created this uh, folio of, of Kashmiri flowers, we, we begin to see Kashmiri flowers, the narcissus, the iris, the tulip, especially these three flowers, appearing as almost a recurring leitmotif of all Mughal art. Uh, we begin to see this trend towards a naturalistic uh, portraiture, where the portrait of a particular nobleman or a prince or a, a uh, an empress or a uh, you know a, a ruler may be in any setting. It is almost a generic setting where you cannot identify whether it's in Agra or or Delhi or Lahore. But you, however, do see the Mughal flower depiction of the Kashmiri flower appearing very very discreetly somewhere in the frame. So this image to the right shows. Uh, uh, what seems to be Noor Jahan holding up a narcissus in her hand. Uh, whereas uh, to the left, we see, uh, you know, which is the painting of, uh, you know, uh, sorry, to the right, we see the painting of the zebra, which was a gift by Mir Jafar to Jahangir, and Jahangir did describe him. You see the borders of flowers, which are, uh, you know, shof Kashmiri flowers. Uh, to the right is a portrait of Raja Bikramjit. Uh, the portrait of the, the, the personality may not be as interesting, but what interests us is the depiction of flowers around its border, because here you can actually see uh, individual flowers that you can uh, identify as Kashmir, as, as species identifiable in Kashmir, indigenous subspecies uh, in these portraits. And uh, here, therefore, we see uh, another portrait where a woman is holding up a narcissus, uh, sa standing by her side is, is a bunch of, of narcissus or nargis, and down her sash uh, in her, on her costume, you can see uh, uh, tulips uh, streaming down her sash. So what then happens is that post the folios of Mansoor, the ubiquitous Kashmiri flowers appears in textiles, prayer mats, tent hangings, decorative objects, in, in various materials, in glass, jade, uh, and even in architectural monuments. So Shah Jahan further refines the style and the flower style with its very stylized depiction of Kashmiri flowers in profile against a plain background uh, becomes the signature style of the Mughal. The Kashmiri iris, the Kashmiri rose, poppy, narcissus, tulip, uh, they appear almost in every medium, uh, in decorative art, in jewelry, uh, I'm, uh, in, in architecture, in ivory. And the Mughals drew in these Kashmiri flowers, uh, single buds, flowering plants, but they were all indigenous to Kashmir. And what is interesting is that even though the artist might have been in faraway Dakhan, so we have this object of Bidri, for example, uh, the flower is not a local Dakkani flower, which is depicted, but the iris. We see the same trend going across textiles, because at the time of Akbar, uh, 40,000 karkhanas are recorded, uh, you know, in Kashmir, uh, looms, creating pashmina carpets, creating shawls. Uh, and the parmanarm, or the Kashmiri shawl, which we know today as shatush, became part of the attire of the Mughal nobleman. And in these shawls, the patterns were directly inspired by the Mughal gardens. So we have a pattern called the neherma, or the canal. Uh, we have a pattern which shows the chevron from the, the design on the abshar, or the river, the water shoots 
as they cascade down the terraces. And each one of these, uh, which are seen in the gardens of Shalimar, Verena, Nishat, appear as textile design within carpets, within shawls. And uh, Jahangir, in fact, uh, made the Parma Narm almost uh, something that we would imagine being exclusive to the emperor's use. And he records numerous occasions where almost as a, a, a gift or as a, a gesture of great uh, respect, he gifts a nobleman or a favorite, uh, uh, you know, uh, warrior the shawl a kashmiri shawl as uh, as a gift as only a royal gift and that goes down through the 19th century to the kashmiri shawl uh, which is a mughal shawl which depicts the entire range of of, Kash of the mughal gardens along the dal uh, along with their charvag depictions in plan uh, which became uh, which was sent to queen victoria as uh, as a tribute and there comes a shift in Mughal architectural decoration because the I would take 1619 as the watershed year. Uh, and uh, what we see before the gardens of Shalimar and Verinag uh, and after in uh, influences tremendously Mughal architectural decoration. So if we see the buildings of the Mughals before, before uh, the Jahangir period, and especially before the creation of the Kashmir gardens, uh, all the, the, decora the decorative elements, whether it's inlay in stone or in woodwork, uh, they're, they're, they're geometric patterns. Whether we see the, uh, the, the structures of Mayu's tomb or we see structures within Sikri. In Fatehpur Sikri, in the Turkish Sultana's residence, we do see florals, but these are very heavy uh, pomegranates or the kind of of floral depictions that were uh, would be seen in Turkish architecture, uh, in Ottoman architecture, but we do not see uh, this. Uh, what we see later in the time of Shah Jahan, in particular, uh, in, for example, the remodeling, uh, the structures that were remodeled during the, the Shah Jahan period in Agra Fort or in Shah Jahanabad, in the Red Fort in Delhi, and then later even in the bar reliefs, the, the marble friezes uh, in the Taj Mahal, we see very clear depictions of irises, of crown imperials, of Narcissi, uh, the Kashmiri flowers in full bloom. And here to the top right, uh, the two images are from Amir. And as I mentioned, Amir had a definite connect with with Jahangir and with the gardens of Kashmir. Uh, and here in the, in the uh, Shish Mahal of Amir, you see within uh, incised plaster, within uh, the, you know, uh, the Aleppo glasswork, uh, and within the painted frescoes of Amir, clear depictions of Kashmir's flora, which is strange because it is in, in Rajasthan and we do not see local marigolds and local uh, you know, flowers of the plains, but we see pl flowers of Kashmir blooming across Amir's uh, decorative motifs. And to the center at the bottom, we see in Lahore, uh, in the Wazir Khan Mosque, and in, uh, in, uh, also in Lahore Fort, we see clear depictions in terracotta, as well as, as uh, uh, lime plaster, and in painted surface, we see depictions of irises. And that then, uh, by the time we get to, uh, you know, the the Divane Khas within the the Red Fort in Delhi, where we see depictions of cyclamens and uh, and Kashmiri flowers right in the 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 marble uh, filigree jali of uh, you know the sort of the inner sanctorum of the Mughals, uh, two woodcuts with ivory, and by the time of Shah Jahan the iris becomes the crown of the multifoil Shah Jahani arch, which then goes on right through late Mughal into Jat as well as Rajput architecture. So the Kashmiri iris uh, becomes the center of the crown of the Mughal arch. And that is definitely a political statement depicting Kashmir as the crown of the Mughal empire. And therefore what we see emerging with the gardens of Kashmir is a parallel activity of, uh, of art, architecture, 
as well as poetry. And let's finally come to the gardens of Kashmir. So here we have Shalimar, the first garden, the first royal garden built in these steps, built as charbags, but in two stages as Shah Jahan, as prince and then as emperor. And what Kashmir's garden did was completely change the paradigm of Islamic gardens, because by uh, definition, the Islamic walled gardens were walled. They were built within walls because they were being they were being created in a hot or arid climate. Uh, whether it was Persia, which was an arid plateau where you had to bring in water with canats and underground subterranean channels from far away to create this little patch of green, this oasis within a desert landscape, to the gardens of the Arabs and across. Central Asia, and then even in the hot plains of India, the gardens were really had to be protected from the harsh environment uh, with a wall. Here in Kashmir, they never needed protection because the environment was so, so complementary and it was so beautiful and it was paradise altogether. So therefore, in Kashmir, we see that the walled garden doesn't require a wall and it uses the, the mountains, the Zabarwan mountains and the Pir Panjal mountains as its defining feature. So here in Shalimar, you have the mountains to one side and the lake to the other. And you have the streams gurgling, gushing through the central water channels because they have learned from the Shamiris how to draw water directly from, from the river streams through canals. Uh, these gardens are no longer just funerary gardens or, or subservient to buildings. They are complete in themselves. And therefore, they become the Diwani Aam, the Diwani Khas of the Mughal kings when they are in, in Kashmir. So when the Mughal court moves to Kashmir, the, all the activities that would otherwise be held within the bastions of the forts at Agra or Lahore or Delhi are really held in the gardens, in the open in Kashmir. And these pavilions then double up as Diwane Arms and Diwane Khas. And there's a particular description of Timur uh, sitting on top of a, of a stone throne with, a water, uh, with water running beneath him. And you can see the clear depiction uh, in architecture of this to the right, this image of Shalimar, where the throne is placed above the gurgling, gushing water stream, uh, harking back to Timur and their Mughal lineage. Uh, this is when the gardens look frozen in time, in, uh, you know, in the dead of winter, and then they come alive with, uh, with the gushing water in summer and spring. And the beauty of each of these gardens was how they changed color with the seasons. Uh, this uh, to the bottom is the, uh, the design that in the, uh, the uh, design of the base of the, uh, the column uh, within the Shalimar Bagh. Uh, and now I will, and this to the right is the throne where the emperor would sit and give darshan because Jharokha darshan uh, is in a, a very in, intrinsic part of the Mughal courtly ritual. So the court would continue with Jharokha Darshan, but the, here in Kashmir, the emperor would sit on this throne and be seen by his public and his, his realm. In Nishat, we see how the garden is built by the, the nobleman. Uh, so we have uh, the, the nobleman, uh, who is obviously related to the queen, Begum Nur Jahan, create this 12 terraced garden where he's drawing in the cosmological uh, sort of uh, principles of the 12 zodiacs. And we know that uh, during Jahangir's time, we have zodiac coins and, and they're looking at, you know, zodiac and auspicious dates for every activity. So these gardens then bring in uh, not perhaps religious, but definitely other symbolism within garden planning. Uh, and again, the axes. So whereas other Mughal gardens are inward looking and insular because they have to really shelter themselves from the harsh environment, in Kashmir, they look outwards towards the mountains on one side and towards the lake on the other. So the visual axis really is stretched and elongated and allows it to cover both and sort of span across uh, the natural features of Kashmir. Uh, in celebration of the beauty of Kashmir. So Nishat Bagh, uh, in all its, its uh, glory, 
with the 12 terraces of Nishat Bagh. Uh, also, Unt Kadal, which becomes a kind of a visual connect and the visual pivot around which uh, the garden is laid. Uh, here we also see elements of gardens, cascades, fountains, which are unprecedented before this in, in Islamic gardens because because of the, the gravity, the natural gravity afforded by this the incline as well as the fact that these are fed from, uh, from uh, mountain rivers and springs. Uh, Kashmir ups the ante as far as garden hydrology goes. Uh, and again, planting, I mentioned authentic Mughal and Timurid species, but even Ilkhanid species. For example, the puny, which blooms in the gardens of Kashmir alone, uh, comes from, is indigenous to China, and it draws its, its uh, you know, it, it, you can link it to uh, the fact that Kublai Khan, after uh, capturing uh, parts of China, brings the, introduces puny to the Tughlaq, the Timurid Ilkhanid garden design, and that is how it comes to Kashmir. Uh, Pari Mehel is built later in the time of Shah Jahan by Ali Mardan Khan, who is a Persian uh, who was working, uh, who, who was the nobleman and uh, governor of Kabul under Shah uh, of Iran, and then switches sides and joins um, Shah Jahan. And when Shah Jahan uh, uh, commissions him to create this garden of Pari Mehel, we have Ali Mardan Khan actually reciting and composing a Shaivite verse in honor of Shiva and describing the Mahadev temple of Shalimar. So we have this amazing, almost a liberal cultural flowering of garden making, of poetry, uh, with even the governors of the Mughals being patrons of gardens. And what Ali Mardan Khan learns about Shamiri and then later Mughal irrigation techniques in Kashmir, the next year when he is made governor of Lahore, he uses that to create the, the great uh, canal in Lahore that feeds the Shalimar gardens of Lahore. So Kashmir influences uh, gardens across the Mughal realm. This is the garden of Pari Mehel, uh, which is one of the late last gardens of the imperial uh, Mughal gardens, designed and laid out by Prince Dara Shuko for his peer and Murshid. Uh, uh, who, and he designs this in eight terraces. Uh, eight being the number of the planets. And this was supposed to be a place of great Sufi uh, sort of uh, dervishes and Sufi evenings and poetry recitals. So each of these, this is a view of uh, Pari Mehel from an upper terrace. So each of these gardens, instead of being just an insular garden, opened out, uh, you know, towards Kashmir's beauty, and at the same time, in a sense, appropriated the mountains and the lakes of Kashmir into the garden planning. Uh, this is the garden of Achabal, which completely redefines uh, Mughal hydrology. And here, because this is so close to, uh, it feeds off the river Jhelum, uh, the scale of, of water and the depth of the tanks is unprecedented. Uh, and that uh, later in, in the gardens of Deeg, for example, by the Jat rulers and the garden, later gardens of, of the Rajputs uh, really draw on the learnings of uh, Verinag and Achabal. And Verinag in particular, because uh, Verinag was a sacred site. It is the source of the River Jehelam, the, the main river of Kashmir, and has been uh, held sacred by the Kashmiri Hindus for centuries before. Uh, here, uh, the inscription of the Jahangir period with the, around the octagonal tomb refers to this as being Jue Bishisht or the river of paradise. And that again is a kind of an extension uh, by default of taking a local uh, religious symbol and appropriating that within the concept and the larger uh, concept of nation building uh, of the Mughal Empire. Uh, so we have to the right uh, from a, a, a painting from uh, a Masnavi of Zafar Khan. Now Zafar Khan is the governor of Kashmir during the time of Shah Jahan. And uh, this is a depiction of Shah Jahan in court with his courtiers 
but instead of this being inside a fort is really within Berenag, the octagonal tank. And this is emperor in court in Kashmir, uh, while here we have emperor at leisure with the backdrop of Dal. Uh, we have this to the left, another from the folio of Zafar Khan, uh, which shows at Nishat, the emperor at leisure, and you can identify the Chinar trees in the backdrop, as well as the last uh, pavilion at Nishar very clearly in this particular painting. And uh, so this is really the emperor at court. And this is uh, the Jharokha Darshan, which happens as part of the Mughal ritual being played out in the gardens of Kashmir. But at the same time, how it influences uh, the, the rest of Mughal art is uh, our paintings from the, the Bacha Nama. And here, this is this is a generic image of the emperor at court and giving Jharokha Darshan. And we can understand architecturally that this is showing the emperor within Agra fort, uh, within the Diwane Khas. But at the same time, we see that there's a frieze of Kashmiri flowers behind the emperor. And whether this frieze is painted on fabric and hung behind him, or it is painted on marble, it is very clearly the depiction of Kashmir within the Mughal uh, court proceedings, which might not be happening in Kashmir, but in Agra. And this, again, to the left is a folio from Zafar Khan's Matsnavi, showing the act of neher making or the act of creating the, the canals, uh, showing how the water is coming from a river spring in the mountain and how it is then bifurcated and channeled into the garden of Zafar Khan. And Zafar Khan is interesting as, an, as a character because he is not just a, a governor, uh, but he is himself a poet. And he composed four Matnavis and four great volumes of, of poetry in Persian. And he created four gardens in Kashmir, not just uh, the imperial gardens, but also gardens of mobility. And here to the left, you see a Mughal painting showing the Dara Shiko in a garden with musicians. And this is an image of uh, depicting Pari Mehel. Uh, so the, the gardens act as courtly spaces. They act as cultural spaces. They also act as religious places. So even today, uh, there are festivals uh, for the Kashmiri Pandits, uh, Navre, or uh, what would be the Navroz, uh, or the New Year, is signified by the blossoms of almond in Badam Wadi, which was a Mughal orchard of almond. Um, cultural ethos, you would have WhatsApp messages going across the Kashmiri community uh, with photographs of almonds blossoming. So these are again staged in the Mughal gardens. Uh, the, uh, the Kashmiri Hindu festival Asta or the river Jhelum, is the center of it is the Verinag spring or in the garden of Verinag. And so and, and the gardens uh, in Besakhi during the, uh, the new year, the Hindu or Sikh new year, the act of reopening the gardens after uh, the winter was really in this, uh, were linked to the gardens of Kashmir. A huge body of literature, of Persian literature and then Kashmiri literature uh, and poetry, uh, which has its roots in both Persian literature, which has poetic metaphors of gardens, as well as Sufi poetry of Kashmir and the Sufi traditions of Kashmir uh, are, are abundant uh, within, within these gardens. And therefore, garden metaphors identifies uh, is very strong and uh, an entire body of literature uh, down to, uh, you know, Thomas More and down to Led Zeppelin uh, describing, you know, or, or bringing in uh, the beauty of Kashmir. Uh, so therefore the garden enclosure and, and changes with Kashmir, Kashmir's garden redefine the act of hydrology within Mughal gardens, uh, they completely redefine water systems. And to the left, as you can see, the, the, from Humayu's tomb to Sandra, to Taj Mahal, to Savdarjang, with all the panoply of Mughal gardens, water is restricted and it is narrow and shallow with very little, it is still water. And to the right where you see it come to the, and, and the, in the middle, we can see an image from Lahore Fort. And here again, the water, even though it's on the mighty river Ravi, the Rahor Fort, the water channels are narrow and shallow, just barely using water. And to the right, we have the gardens of Kashmir with an abundance of water gurgling, 
uh, uh, you know, springing through streams, through fountains. Uh, so Kashmir completely redefines the way the water systems of the Mughals are. Uh, these are just a whole range of flowers and plant species that are true to the Timurid pattern, uh, which were grown and continue to grow in Kashmir. Uh, and uh, after Shah Jahan uh, building the gardens of Shalimar in Delhi and, uh, and Lahore, uh, we see then it almost ceasing in Kashmir. The act of garden building ceases with Aurangzeb. And uh, however, when Aurangzeb's wife's Makpara is built far away in Aurangabad, uh, and when they are not using Makrana any longer, and it almost seems like a poor copy of the Taj Mahal, the incised plaster still draws on Kashmiri flower motifs. And that continues right through later Mughal, uh, you know, right through the, the buildings of uh, Delhi and, uh, and then through uh, Jat and, uh, uh, and uh, Rajput architecture. And even Sikh architecture in the Kila Mubarak, still alluding to those irises in their, in their arches and to, to Kashmiri plantation in the architectural motifs. Uh, so whereas the, the, the gardens of Kashmir draw from the gardens of Iran, they go on to influence later gardens of Shalimar Garden in Lahore. Uh, they, they change the way gardens uh, are looked at just as a backdrop to buildings, as in the case of Humayun's tomb and the Taj Mahal, to really become center stage and to really become the hero of, uh, of the architectural complex. Thank you. I will end here.